It's very windy. It's very windy. Amy, are we good? <laughs> Can't necessarily ask the press. I think we got everybody we need for our speakers. Should we go ahead and get started? Good morning. Good morning, everyone. We have some people coming in right now. Um, my name is Sarah Finger. I am the founder and executive director of the Wisconsin Alliance for Women's Health. And it is my incredible honor to be here today to help launch a bold new legislative initiative in Wisconsin. While I'm officially here in my capacity as a women's health advocate, I'm also proud to stand here as a woman, as a patient, as the mother of two little patients at home, and as the coordinator of care for my family. The vision of our organization is that every woman at every age and every stage of life is able to reach her optimal health, safety, and economic security. Unfortunately, reaching that vision in our state has been more difficult in the last few years as legislative hurdle after legislative hurdle have been put in place to make it harder for women to access care, information, and services they need and deserve. That's why today I am incredibly grateful to Senator John Erpenbach and Representative Chris Taylor, who are here to share their proactive vision for reproductive health in Wisconsin with the patients and the introduction of the Patients Reproductive Health Act. And now to share why he is motivated to author and introduce this groundbreaking legislation, please welcome Senator John Erpenbach. Thank you, and good morning. Uh, good morning, everybody, and thanks for coming out. All of these people in white coats behind me remind me I really need to get in for a physical. Uh, it's, been, it's, it's been too long. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, in the last few years, uh, we have seen legislative Republicans and Governor Walker chip away and in some cases take an ax to one of the most important relationships that people have, and that's the relationship between themselves and their doctor. But the fact of the matter is that those Republicans and the politicians, Republican politicians don't really care about what happens in the examination room when I go in uh, at all as a man. What they care about is when my wife, my daughter, or my sisters go in and uh, have a visit with their doctor. That's when they want to tell doctors what they can and cannot say and what kind of care they can and cannot provide to the patients. And Republicans have told doctors that they have to perform ultrasounds when best medical practices don't necessarily call for it. They have told women that the person who performs the ultrasound doesn't even have to be medically trained to do so. And the information that that non-medically trained person uh, provides may not even be accurate. Where you live should not dictate what kind of care you receive. Here in Wisconsin, Republicans have told doctors that they only need hospital admitting privileges for abortions, not heart procedures. Republicans are putting things like probable post-fertilization age into Wisconsin statutes when it isn't even medically recognized as terminology. That's why we're here today, to introduce the Patient Reproductive Health Act. Patients deserve to know their doctors are giving them medically accurate, comprehensive care, medically accurate information and comprehensive care, and doctors shouldn't have to consult their legal team before providing care to their patients. That's why we're here today. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Senator Erpenbach. And now, um, the other author of the bill, Representative Chris Taylor, is here to share why authoring this bill is so incredibly important to her and the women of Wisconsin. Well, thank you so much, and thank you to everybody who is here. I have um, behind me, among other people, some of the foremost experts, really, in women's health in our state, and so I'm really honored to be here, and I want to thank Senator Erfenbach for authoring this legislation with me, which is a wonderful um, piece of legislation to get back to really what health care should be. And health care really should be patient-centered based on what patients need to be healthy. Every patient should be able to trust that the medical information that they get from their provider is medically accurate, not politically dictated. Every patient should be able to trust that the medical care they receive from their physician is based on best practices and patient health care, not politics. And physicians must have the right to provide medically accurate care based on the best medical science and their medical training, not a script that's dictated by politicians. No politician should have the right to interfere with your medical care or your relationship with your physician. But unfortunately, Governor Walker and Republican legislators have inserted themselves into the examination room. They want to interfere with what your physician tells you and dictate what health care services your physician must or must not provide regardless of a patient's health. Republican politicians love to talk about the importance of privacy and freedom when it comes to ending investigations into political corruption or when allowing unlimited corporate money into elections. But when it's applied to women's health care, they violate basic privacy rights and private medical decisions that should be between a patient and her physician, not patients and politicians. And that's really why we're here today. Many of the policies advanced by this governor and this legislature really make it impossible for women to get the comprehensive care that they need. What the Patients Reproductive Health Act does is take patient health care, particularly women's health care, from a land of political activism by the Republican Party and return it to patient center care based on medicine and best practices. And the bill does this in several main ways. First, by establishing a legal right for every patient uh, to receive medically accurate information from their provider. That should be every patient's legal right. And this bill makes it absolutely crystal clear that it is. Establishing a legal right and obligation for every physician to provide medically accurate yeah. information free from political interference, which is really what we all want. It also <coughs> breaks down laws that have no basis in medical evidence or widely accepted standards of patient care. Though this bill um, recognizes the conscious rights of those individual health care providers who do not wish to provide reproductive health care, it also recognizes and protects the conscious rights of those providers who believe that they have a moral, ethical, and legal obligation to provide comprehensive reproductive health care. These providers cannot be discriminated against in employment, and that's one of the very important provisions of this bill. Finally, this bill protects both patients and providers from dangerous and threatening behavior that continues to be directed at women who seek reproductive health care and those who provide it. The Patients Reproductive Health Act really puts the focus of health care where it should be, and that is on the medical needs of the patient rather than on the political agenda of the Republican politicians. At the end of the day, this bill is really about getting back to basics, about putting personal private health care decisions where they belong, not in this capital, but between patients and their physicians. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Representative Taylor. Um, as noted, policies have been passed in our state with complete disrespect and disregard to those with the medical education expertise and evidence. And we are grateful today for two incredible physician leaders who have joined us to speak to why the Wisconsin, why Wisconsin patients and healthcare professionals really need and deserve the Patients Reproductive Health Act. Um, oh, sorry, Dr. Lowey, um, or no, Dr. Ann, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I'd first like to welcome Dr. Angela Janice to provide some remarks. Um, Dr. Janice is a practicing psychiatrist in Wisconsin and a board member of both the Wisconsin Alliance for Women's Health and for Physicians for Reproductive Health. Dr. Janice. 
Hello. Um, as, as a psychiatrist, I cannot overstate how important it is for the doctor-patient relationship to be grounded in trust. This need for an open and honest relationship between patient and provider is especially important when patients are seeking for what at times can be more medi sensitive medical issues, such as mental or reproductive health care. When politicians interfere with the doctor-patient relationship, it greatly undermines my and my colleagues' ability to provide the best care possible to our patients. This is why the recent attacks on reproductive health care in Wisconsin are so troubling to those of us who practice medicine. I spent four years in medical school, four years in residency, and four years serving patients as a clinician. I am subject to rigorous continuing education, ethical and licensing standards, all of which I must meet in order to continue in practice medi practicing medicine in Wisconsin. The fact is, most politicians are not doctors, and they do not have the medical education to dictate to physicians how to best serve their patients. When politicians use political agendas, not medical science, to dictate health care in our state, it's bad for patients and it's bad for the integrity of medicine. When a patient comes to my office seeking psychiatric care, she can trust that our relationship will be free of unnecessary political intrusion and that we will be allowed to build a doctor-patient relationship based on trust and my ethical obligation to provide her with compassionate and comprehensive care that she needs. Clearly, the same should be true for women who seek reproductive health care in Wisconsin. Women need to hear from their doctors and other health care professionals about their reproductive care options in a trusting environment free of politics. And that is exactly why Wisconsin needs the Patients Reproductive Health Act, and that's why I'm excited to be here today to support it. Many of us in medicine are fed up with the unprecedented political assault on our profession that has taken place in Wisconsin. Even more importantly, we are concerned about how this attack on reproductive health care will negatively affect the patients we serve. It's time to give Wisconsin patients and doctors the right to access and provide health care, free from unwarranted political intrusion. More than anything, this is what the PRH Act stands for, and I'm happy to support this important legislation because my patients deserve this right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Janice, for taking the time to be here today and share your insight. Um, I'd like now like to introduce Dr. Doug Lauby, who is an OBGYN who is past president of the American Congress of Obstetricians and Gynecologists and is past chair of the Department of OBGYN at the University of Wisconsin. Dr. Lauby. Thank you and good morning. Uh, I'd like to sen uh, thank Senator Erpenbach and uh, Representative Taylor for their support of this uh, very important legislation. As past president of the American College and the former chair of this department here at UW-Madison, uh, I have been intensely involved with the education of medical students and residents to assist them in learning the best evidence-based way to take care of women, including in techniques of comprehensive reproductive health. <coughs> As a result, I'm greatly disturbed by the unprecedented assault uh, by uh, right-wing politicians in Wisconsin the past four years. One of the most troubling aspects of this political attack has been the junk science which has been used to promulgate the passage of legislation designed to limit access to reproductive health care for uh, Wisconsin women. From the unnecessary informed consent, which by the way reads more like a sixth grade lecture to 12-year-old girls, to admitting privileges requirements, to abortion bans based on misrepresentations of medical science regarding fetal pain, the Wisconsin legislature has become obsessed with infusing reproductive health care in Wisconsin with bogus scientific claims. As a physician, I can't tell you how hard it is for patients uh, that we try to care for when they expect us to provide them with information and advice based on medical training and experience and then read to them scripts written by uneducated politicians. That's why I'm excited to support the Patients Reproductive Health Act, which would ensure that when patients are making important decisions about their reproductive health care, they can count on making them based on the best available evidence. Lastly, I'd like to address the issue of safety both patient safety and provider safety. I have personally uh, been exposed to a variety of efforts at intimidation, at harassment, and even physical violence at the uh, destruction of uh, part of a clinic that I worked at a number of years ago 
by uh, right-wing extremists. I have experienced protesters around my home here in Madison who have decided that they would bring out ugly posters of uh, fetal parts right at the time the school buses arrive and depart each morning and each afternoon so that eight and nine-year-old children are exposed to this sort of intimidation. So I am excited to be able to participate in a bill which will help assure that, that these techniques are no longer used. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Laube. Um And last but definitely not least, I'd like to welcome Regina Oh, Vitiver. I see, and I knew it when I walked in, but Regina Vitiver, who is here to share why the Patients' Reproductive Health Act is so incredibly important to her as a patient. Again, this is called the Patients' Reproductive Health Act, so we're very excited to welcome Regina to share her thoughts on this bill. Thank you for having me. At 21 weeks into my first pregnancy, my standard ultrasound showed there was a growth on our little guy's back, and the doctors couldn't tell where it was coming from. We were advised to let him develop for another few weeks and have another ultrasound. By that time, the tumor had grown substantially. An MRI showed it was two-thirds of the way wrapped around his spinal cord, though he wasn't paralyzed yet. Over the next days and weeks, we conferred with multiple specialists, radiologists, maternal fetal medicine specialists, pediatric surgeons. We eventually were able to schedule a biopsy and learned that our little guy had infantile fibrosarcoma which was universally fatal when it appeared on the trunk of a child under age two. Our choices were to knowingly subject our innocent baby to the pain and suffering of surgery and chemotherapy with nearly no chance of survival, or to keep him from ever feeling pain by ending the pregnancy. They would inject potassium chloride into his heart and I would deliver him, stillborn. We discussed our options with our doctors we conferred with our rabbi, our family, and our friends. We made the choice that was no choice at all to end our very much wanted pregnancy. But because he was now past the point of viability, we also had to get approval from the hospital ethics board. So many people were involved in our decision. But you know who wasn't? Our legislators or our governor. They didn't know us. They didn't know our situation. And they certainly weren't going to be the ones standing by our side as we held our dying baby. The purpose of the bill being introduced today, the Patients' Reproductive Health Act, is to ensure that fundamental medical decisions remain between patients and their doctors, where they belong. This bill helps protect our inalienable right to liberty, to live a life free from government coercion into the most private and personal aspects of our lives, our medical care. Who could argue against that? Thank you so much, Regina. That concludes our comments for today, and now we're available to answer any questions you might have um, for the legislators or for some of us as advocates or um, healthcare professionals. Uh, first, Senator Urban Beck, uh, Representative Taylor, is this one bill? Is this a package of bills? Is it out for co sponsorship? Go ahead. Yeah, uh, it's one bill, and we will have a draft to you very, very soon. So it is one bill. Dealing with point three, how do you deal with the First Amendment concerns <laughs> that come with, some, I mean, blocking protests or something along that? I'm, without seeing the language, I don't know specifically how it says it here. Yeah, I mean, we deal with it how the law deals with it. It's not about, you know, we all support First Amendment rights, but that does not include harassing or threatening or being violent towards an individual. So we really do the existing law that prohibits certain conduct, and we apply it in this context so that women are not harassed and threatened and physicians are not harassed and threatened. What concretely are you prohibiting? Well, we're prohibiting behavior that intimidates, harass, threatens uh, reproductive health care providers uh, or patients who are seeking the care. Just give us an example. Well, sure, if you're walking into a clinic and you're grabbed and you're pulled and you're somehow assaulted, that would not be allowed. That would be subject to a felony under this law. So we're basically taking existing law that pertains to harassment restraining orders and how harassment is defined, and also protections that are currently in federal law from federal face uh, legislation and applying it at the state level. And constitutionally, I think we feel we're on pretty solid ground. 
If we're not and there's better language to make the ground more solid, we'll we'll use it. But constitutional we feel we're on we're on pretty solid ground. Yeah, this has been vetted, this legislation um, by First Amendment rights groups like the ACLU. Do any other states have a similar provision in all? Well, we have the Federal FACE Act that applies to every state, so we take some of those provisions. But yeah, other states do have are, are similar in defining these terms in other contexts, like in harassment restraining orders. So other states do have similar definitions that we're just applying in this context. And as far as legislation overall in other states, this will be the first real comprehensive uh, piece of legislation that, that we'll see in the nation. And uh, Wisconsin, again, is, is on the edge of, of what we feel uh, most of the people in this state would agree with. And, uh, as well as uh, others around the country. So I would look for this legislation to be rolled out in other, other states as well. Do y'all think there'll be a federal lawsuit against that 20 week abortion ban? Do you see that happening? Well, there are lawsuits <clears throat> currently pending against a 20 week abortion ban, not here in the state of Wisconsin, but in other states. Well, that's what, just because I have a, I work for Wisconsin newspaper, do y'all think there'll be one here? Um, you know, I'm just not sure. There's not one now. But there are other lawsuits in other states moving forward that are very, very similar. And I would, I would tend to think there's a lot of people within this state who are keeping pretty close eye on, on, on those lawsuits. Yeah, I think someone might be in the room. I would tend to think there are some people in the state keeping pretty close eye on what's going on with those lawsuits. Okay. Yeah. So this institutional refusal elimination is essentially a facility that currently does not provide reproductive health care would have to provide it. How does that work? No. Um, what the bill says is that if a, if a hospital is providing maternity care and there is a provider at the hospital who is willing to provide comprehensive reproductive health care, they cannot be discriminated in providing that care. So in other words, if, there, if, if there's a doctor within the facility that wants to provide services uh, to, to a woman in comprehensive care, they have the hospital has to make that available to that doctor within the hospital. They can't discriminate against that doctor. So if a doctor wants to provide abortions, they must be allowed to provide abortions? Or any or birth control or sterilization procedures if the if that hospital does provide maternity care. So it does mandate that if you're serving women in one capacity and you have physicians who believe it's in their patient's best interest to receive these services, um, which are standard of care that you must be allowed as a provider to provide those services. So a hospital, so hospitals such as St. Mary's, which is a Catholic hospital, mm -hmm. would have to provide abortions because they provide reproductive care? They would have to provide the spectrum of, of reproductive uh, health care for, for a woman if there is a doctor within St. Mary's who chooses to do so. If there's not a doctor, then then they don't have to provide the facility for that. Yeah. And, and the reason why this is, excuse me, doctor, the reason why this is important, if you take a look at around, uh, take a look around the state, what's going on with the healthcare provider situations, you have providers merging with providers and so on and so forth. So the ability for a woman to get comprehensive uh, health care uh, is limited, depending on where you happen to live in the state. So that, that's why this particular provision of the legislation is, is really important. Excuse me for interrupting. There, there are other examples beyond abortion as well. And, uh, having to do with, uh, I think uh, Representative Taylor mentioned tubal sterilizations, particularly at the time of cesarean delivery, mm -hmm. and other uh, less invasive things like post-placental insertion of IUDs, uh, depending on the opinions and or the, uh, the hospital administrative uh, policies. So if there are physicians, which are most OBGYNs actually, who are capable of providing these sorts of services, working in facilities where it is uh, prohibited by policy, then this law uh, would, would address that. So you would dictate to hospitals what kind of coverage they, sh they can provide? Or should provide. No. Mm -hmm. we're, what we're saying is why shouldn't a reproductive health care provider have the same rights to provide the care based on their conscience and their medical ethics that a provider has to refuse to provide such care? So that's what this does. If there is a reproductive health care provider who has determined that it is the best interest of their patient to receive certain services, that provider cannot be discriminated against by that institution in providing basic reproductive health care, like if it's sterilization, it's sterilization, birth control, counseling, that sort of thing. So we're just leveling the playing field. That it's true, physicians should be able to refuse 
to provide care, we're protecting that, but we're also protecting physicians who want to provide the care they believe their patients need. They can no longer be discriminated against and be told, you cannot provide the care that you've determined your patient needs. Those rights are going to be protected by this legislation. So if you have a, I'm sorry, so if you have a physician who performs hysterectomies, for example, at a certain hospital that doesn't provide abortions, if that doctor were to say, I want to provide abortions, you have to allow me to do that because I'm already providing reproductive care in another form. This only pertains to hospitals that offer maternity services. And what this legislation is saying is, look, you, a patient should have the right, and a physician should have the right, to provide comprehensive care that women routinely need throughout their lives. What do you mean by maternity services? Obstetric. Maternal care, obstetric care. Obstetric care, which is not hysterectomies. No. It, this particular piece of the legislation, along with a couple of others, really underscores the heart of what we're trying to get at here, and that's the doctor-patient relationship. We are taking decisions and, and putting them in the hands of the doctor and the patient, and making sure that the patient gets the medically accurate information they need in order to make the decision, as opposed to the hospital poli policy saying, okay, doctor, so-and-so, you may think that this is what, what your patient needs and what your patient has decided to do, but you can't do it here. You're really putting that decision into the willing provider's hands uh, along with the patient. Yeah, this is getting back to patient-centered medical care, which is what we all want. It doesn't matter if you're a woman, man, child. You should have the right to get care that you need. And your physician should have the right to provide medically accurate, comprehensive care that their patients need. And that's what we're really trying to return to with this piece of legislation. So talk about why, just with this, with this right of conscience provision, talk about why you feel you're constitutionally sound as far as you know, the First Amendment rights that, I, you know, that a Catholic institution might or might not have. Well, I mean, I'm not sure why we wouldn't be constitutionally sound. There's no specific, well, there's no specific right in our Constitution that says institutions have the right to refuse. I mean, when you're getting public money and you serve the public and you're an entity that employs people and serves people um, who don't necessarily, they're not necessarily Catholic, they're not necessarily whatever type of, of specific religion, what this bill gets back to is making sure if you're going to offer maternity services, that women have the, the opportunity to access a full range of services if their provider has determined that's in their best interest. So I don't think there's a constant, I mean, if anything, I think we're making certain we protect the individual uh, rights, which is recognized in our Constitution, the individual rights. And I think that we're being very, very careful to respect that. Mm -hmm. But it has to work both ways. You have to also say that the rights of a provider to provide that care that they say they're ethically obligated to provide, they're morally obligated to, to provide, they shouldn't be retaliated against and penalized for providing just basic care that every, that every woman, uh, most women at some point in their lives need. And it's certainly a discussion we obviously have to have. If you have a doctor within a, within a hospital and the hospital's policies, we don't do X, Y, and Z. Yeah. But the doctor says in order for the, 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 whatever the case may be for my patient, we need to perform X, Y, or Z. It's a, it's a discussion we need to have. And doctors do have rights within that situation as well. So it, in the end, we're not telling a hospital they need to do something. They have to do something. We're not telling a doctor they have to do something. We are giving uh, the doctor and the patient options and the hospital options as well, that if you're gonna go, if you're gonna provide maternal care and there is a doctor willing to do the spectrum of, of uh, whatever procedures might be done, then the hospital has to, to make the facility available. Chris, if there's not a doctor then who, who won't do that, then they don't have to. Would you say it's sort of equivalent to compassionate care bill? It's similar. I think that's the, kind the, of- The principle that you're- Yeah, providing. that's right. It is similar that, you know, when, and the Compassion Care for Rape Victims Bill basically <coughs> said that recognized individual conscience rights not to provide that care, but did recognize that women in an emergency situation when they're raped or sexually assaulted should be able to get comprehensive medical information and care. So it is, it's very much modeled after that. Okay. 
I have a corollary comment to make just as an example. Uh, we, in the recent few years, I won't say how many, uh, have had residents leaving our uh, training program here in Madison, moving to other communities in Wisconsin who had been prohibited by contract to provide abortion services, even as moonlighters in other communities. So there's an example of, of discrimination as well, so that if a person wants to go to another town of 100,000 or so in, in Wisconsin, work for a system which prohibits the provision of abortion services, but wants to drive to another town where he or she could do that, they are <coughs> prohibited by contract. Is, is that contract prohibition aimed specifically at abortion, or is it part of a broader contract? No, it's aimed us? specifically at abortion. Hmm. And you won't name the institution? I won't, no. Not without permission. One more question. Does sure. the bill provide language for hiring discrimination? Can a hospital under the bill not hire a doctor because of a pro-choice record? No. 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 They cannot be discriminated against because of their beliefs or because of the care that they would like to provide. All right, thanks for coming on. Yeah, thanks everybody. Thank you so much. We'll be available too afterwards. Thank you.